Just to remind everyone, we do not have class on Monday. Monday is Martin Luther King Day, so no class. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So this power, well, this is, since I exported it, I forgot that since I exported it into explain everything, the music doesn't go along with it, but it was well, going to be the music of the upsetter, but yeah. Okay, but this is one of my least favorite topics in biochemistry, which is biophysical chemistry in some respects. It's on bioenergetics and thermodynamics, and it literally drove Boltzmann crazy. And so, I didn't have any view for Gen Chem two whenever it go over thermodynamics. But he's the one that came up, uh, helped drive the Boltzmann equation for the second law of thermodynamics, and um, he did go nuts and commit suicide. And he, for his epitaph that's on his grave, it's his bust, and it's really tall, and it has a second law of thermodynamics. It's all set, second law of thermodynamics across his, his chest is his equation. And so I didn't believe it, and so when I had a friend, I have a friend that went over to Austria back whenever I was in college, uh, before I went over there myself, it's, they went and they took pictures of it. And so when we were at Michigan, they, they're in the chemistry building, we were on the top floor of the chemistry building and they have these huge windows that are like 12 feet tall and there's no screen. And so we had a big picture of Boltzmann right there in case that anyone went nuts studying biochemistry or, or anything, that'd be the last thing that you'd see before you went out the window. <coughs> That's Boltzmann. Well, technically it was his grave. But no, it's the second law of thermodynamics. So, in this chapter, we're just going to be doing primarily a review here for today, or it should be a review with a couple of exceptions of some newer things that have to just do where we make it pertain to chemistry, and biochemistry, I'm sorry. And so, you should know the relationships between free energy, which, what letter do we use to denote free energy in biochemistry and chemistry? G for Gibbs free energy, but there are other free energies out there. Um, enthalpy, which the letter would be H. Entropy, which is S. And then, of course, K, which is the equilibrium constant. And then Q, does anyone remember Q? N not in this instance. Q is the reaction quotient. So, we'll talk a little bit about Q. All right. <clears throat> then, future uh, presentations, we'll go over the common types of biochemical reactions, because there's only so many ways to reinvent the wheel. And then, the importance of ATP in vivo, and the importance of redox reactions in vivo. But there's not. So, I hope that you don't cheat by looking ahead some of you who already had the PowerPoints, because I actually did put the PowerPoint for this one up early. Um, we have bioenergetics. And this, one of the bad things about not being able to use PowerPoint is it gives all the answers right there at once. But what bioenergetics is, is just the way, it's the actual way to quantify, to put a number behind the energy transduction which occurs on living cells. And normally, whenever this is done as normal PowerPoint, I would ask, you know, what does transduction mean? and usually hardly anyone knows. But that's just where you change from one form of energy to another. And so, you know, we had like various transducers, which would may, maybe it's taking electrical into mechanical work or something like that. <clears throat> and so here we're talking about what kind of energy initially, like where does some of the energy come from for us? It's chemical. It's chemical, you're breaking, you're hiding hydrolyzing bonds, chemical bonds. And then later this semester, we actually will see ways to take it from, many times we're just going from one type of chemistry to another type of chemistry, but we'll see some that will do actually like electromotive force or like we'll have like physical changes to something. Like for example, the ATP synthase in mitochondria, it literally turns like a little turnstile for the protons. So it's really cool. Before I get, go to the next slide, what is the first law of thermodynamics? Does anyone remember? Yeah, energy can't be created or destroyed. What else can't? Matter. M matter, or the, yeah. So, don't know how well it 
come up through there, but yeah. And so the first law of, well, they say the first in-law of thermodynamics. <laughs> and so yeah, I thought it was kind of cute. But yes, it's the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. Okay, so it's not an open uh, system. It's a closed system. So you can't create it or destroy it. You can only change it from one form to another form. Okay. What about the second law of thermodynamics? What's the second law? This is where Boltzmann comes into hand. It's one that I really ticked off one of my biophysics professors at Duke with. Right. It's the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. But yes, so I found a couple other cartoons for the Department of Entropy and then the Entropy Seminar, which I really liked, the Entropy of Seminar. Give you a moment to get caught up. <laughs> yep, you'll have to get the little hamster thinking, cranking up there, uh, which I told my brother Cliff that his hamster is called Tripod because it's <laughs> missing a leg. It doesn't go quite as fast. <laughs> it takes a little bit of time to get it warmed up. All right, but yes, it's in all natural processes, the entropy of the universe increases. And so this seems to contradict the body and the cell. So why is it then, first of all, in what way does it seem like our living, you know, our bodies, our cells would be violating the law of, second law of thermodynamics? Right, there's order, there's a direct order to this. And so how does it, how do we compensate for this idea that, we, I mean, obviously we can't really violate the second law of thermodynamics. It's a law, it's not theory. Eventually we die. <laughs> what? I said eventually we die. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what else, what's the one assumption here? Oh, so you're supernatural? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not it. It has to do with like definitions and oh, so, so like, it's with the it's with the system. What system? What we're talking about? What the the order you know with respect to the universe? Because you know exactly right. And so unlike what you do in the lab. You know, where many times you're talking about a closed system, something that's, that's closed with it. Living organisms are open. We are in constant transaction between us and our surroundings. So that's where, as I'm not going to write it all out, and at least in theory, and I don't know how much you go into in Jin Kim 2, but they have like the box within a box and stuff, and the system and the surroundings, how the entire system plus surroundings is equal to the universe. And so therefore, it's not like we are a closed system within ourselves. Okay, so we are constantly having some type of interaction and transaction between us and our surroundings. Okay, and this is the way that the cell can keep its internal order. You know, we have the phospholipid bilayer that we talked about last semester. There's also the subcellular compartmentalization that's very important. And one of the nice thing is for all intents and purposes, cells are going to be isothermal and isobaric. So isothermal means what? Regulated temperature. What's it not? Okay, so iso is... Isolated. No. It stays the right, it means equal. Like an isosceles triangle has two equal sides. Iso means it's equal. Right, constant temperature and isobaric would be pressure, right? So the pressure is relatively constant within the cell itself. So that way you don't have to worry about that changing and having to resort, resort to too much of like differential equations here. But it does require source of free energy. And so here we have the thermodynamic terms. So for example, we had Gibbs free energy, which is G. Many times that's in units of joules per mole or kilojoules per mole or calories or kilocalories per mole. Um, for energy. Okay, so we're talking about 
you know, G and its units. So usually I consider it to be um, joules per mole. <clears throat> and we have enthalpy, which was H. And since this is an isobaric um, process, then you can refer to this as a heat, okay, which really helps. It makes it much more simple than, it would be much more complicated when we talk about what heat and work and everything it would be if it wasn't, if the pressure was changing. Okay, and the, usually enthalpy is also in the same units as, as free energy. So joules or calories per mole. And, oops, that didn't come through very well. But, and calorie, you know, is an older term, which we would think about food. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is like a food calorie is actually a thousand. It's a kilocalorie. Okay, it's just that, you know, they don't want to freak people out by saying that your soda had 140,000 calories in it. So it's a food calorie, it's a capital C. <clears throat> then we have entropy, which was this randomness, this disorder, which, by the way, there is a mathematical way to figure up enthalpy, entropy, I'm sorry, which I had to do in bio, biophysics, and it's just ridiculous. But that's where Boltzmann comes into play. And so entropy is, here, let me just go ahead. And But one thing is I want to point out, and whenever if you do the math behind this, this one does have some math behind it, is that it's in different units. Okay, and usually G and H are really large, and so they're almost always in kilojoules and kilocalories, whereas the entropy is in just joules or calories. And so a lot of times you have to convert to make sure that they're all in the same units. And another thing is entropy does depend upon temperature, and so that's why it's in things like joules per K moles. And K, of course, is Kelvin here. Yep. <clears throat> because we have to be kind of careful because later on you can even incorporate equilibrium k's in the same equation <laughs> so it can be a little bit confusing but there is a way to mathematically come up with um, the formula to find entropy and that's the second law of thermodynamics oops oh whoa 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 well, here, I'll just type it out. And that's S for entropy. And this is what's actually on Boltzmann's grave is equal to K. And it's lowercase k. <clears throat> and technically, it's usually italicized, but the PC version of this doesn't let me italicize it. And that's Boltzmann's constant. Okay. Times... log of W, okay, and this W is the number of microstates possible, <laughs> which is why I say that it's just ridiculous. So, I mean, these are ridiculously large, even for a small atom, ridiculously large numbers, because whenever we see a microstate, it's sort of taking like a quick snapshot and seeing like what does it look like at that point in time. So you can just imagine having two atoms that are bonding of some sort, and they can be in different orientations with respect to each other and different things. So there's all these different possible microstates. And so the theoreticians sit there and they figure it up. And so then delta S is just S initial subtracted from S final. And so that's why it's K log W minus K log W. And you can solve it out using the equation of uh, the properties, I'm sorry, the properties of natural logs. And so you could, you would go crazy just sitting there trying to think about even the water molecule, which has three atoms, all the different possible snapshots you could take of it <clears throat> since they're constantly moving around. And so that's why in the simplest, simplest terms, if you were only thinking in two dimensions, it still becomes quite complicated. So then we have free energy. So we talked about spontaneous versus non-spontaneous. This should definitely be a review, nothing new here, in the fact that delta G must always be negative for it to be spontaneous. 
that's called exergonic. Endergonic is non-spontaneous, and that's when delta G is positive. So you have to put some type of energy into the system. And if delta G is equal to zero, that means it's at equilibrium. Okay. So um, one thing that I can't stress enough is that delta G in of itself, like its value, does not tell you anything about how fast it will be. Just because something is spontaneous doesn't mean it's going to happen quickly. It could happen over, you know, eons and eons of time. It just tells you that you don't have to add any external energy in order for it to go. Okay. So before I go into the next um, next uh, topic, which actually still has to do with the standard free energy, is what were the standard what are the standard states in chemistry? Remember they had like delta G uh, not, you know, the little zero sign. What were the standard states in just general chemistry? What was the concentration? It's one molar. What about temperature? Not zero Kelvin. <laughs> zero, uh, right. Okay, sometimes you'd have some that would do it for 25 degrees Celsius. All right, so why wouldn't those standard states work in biochemistry? Because the body's not at zero degrees Celsius. Right, we're not at zero degrees or even 25 degrees. What would we be at? 37. 37, which is going to be, does anyone know what that is in? In Kelvin. In Kelvin. Oh, well, isn't it just 273 plus 37? Exactly. 310. <laughs> yeah. So it's 310 Kelvin versus 298. Okay. And what about why would the concentration be bad? Think about one instance in particular that something concentration wise that your body, whether you're talking about the brain, the blood, the cell, it doesn't matter. There's one thing that's always around that you have to worry about the concentration of. Pardon? Well, there's, there is oxygen, but that's not... Carbon dioxide? Or and there's carbon dioxide, but that's not what we're worried about. What else is there that's in... Water. in well, just water. Of course, that's solvent, so we don't have to worry about its concentration anyway. Pardon? No. What's the one thing that every cell, you know, standard, you know, they even check it usually when you give blood. It's one of the things that's... Fire. No. Electrolytes? Oh, it's one in particular, a specific yeah. one. Not sodium, not potassium. You guys are thinking really too difficult. Calcium. Not calcium. What's the most general, the most? <laughs> Think of a periodic table. There's chloride, sodium, potassium. So magnesium is one of these, which by the way, they use it as one millimolar if the magnesium is in the reaction, but that's not the one that's the biggie, because not every place will where it has to use my, have to worry about magnesium. You're forgetting the most simple explanation here. Carbon. No, <laughs> that's not an electrolyte. It's not charged. If it is charged, then you're gonna die. I guess be what is the most water. simple possibility? Like the most simple. Hydrogen. Pardon? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, which is also called. Hydrogen. But I mean, in our body, we don't say, oh, what's your concentration of hydrogen? The pH. Oh. <laughs> and so you don't have one molar hydrogen in your body because that'd be extremely, extremely acidic. Like, and so it's just, it doesn't make sense. And so we, for biochemistry, we have different standard states. Okay, that's why uh, in chemistry they use this delta G with a little degree sign, which we, I, we're calling it not. So delta G not. But a lot of times if you look in those same tables, they'll have another one that says delta G not, and they add this little prime sign to it, a little accent. 
possessed delta gene not prime, and that means under biological or biochemical conditions. So in bio biology and biochemistry, we do things that would pertain to the cell, okay? But just to review, if it's a pure solid liquid or pure substance, then you don't even worry about it. Like, remember, it, 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 it's not even a part of the equilibrium constant because the fact is its effective concentration is not changing. That's why you don't have to worry about the concentration of water. It's always approximately 55.5 molar. <clears throat> okay, but for gases, it's one ATM, which for us, it's fine. You know, it's roughly, it's going to change if you go way up high or well below sea level. But for solutions, it's one molar, one mole per liter, and that's just ridiculous uh, for us in vivo because of primarily pH. And then we've already talked about the fact that the body temperature is not at standard temperature, which for some things they talk about zero. A lot of things they talk about 25 degrees being roughly room temperature, but we're at 37 degrees or 310 Kelvin. <clears throat> and then magnesium. Magnesium, we're going to find out in this semester, was, is used in a lot of reactions. And so magnesium stand, biochemistry standard concentration is one millimolar, roughly. And then for the pH, it's 10 to the minus 7 molar, which is the same thing as saying pH 7. Okay. Now, I do expect you to, to have known this e equation. We're going to talk about it again, which is delta G. I'm going to go into greater detail in a moment. Delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT, which R is the gas constant. You do have to pay attention to what the units are. And T, of course, is temperature here. And this, this right here, where is the, is that the, yep. This right here, this equation, the products to the power of their stoichiometry divided by the reactants to the power of their stoichiometry. What is that commonly, what, what, how do we usually abbreviate that You don't want to have to write out products over reactants every time. What is this right here? If it's at equilibrium, it's the equilibrium constant. So you could replace that with KEQ. But what if it's not at equilibrium? That's the reaction quotient. So that's Q. So Q and K, KEQ are the same, except that KEQ is when you are at equilibrium. Q is when you're at any other condition, okay? So that's why Q is equal to the products to their stoichiometry divided by the reactants to the power of their stoichiometry. <coughs> so essentially this is what I just said before. Well, and the reason why is mathematically we can prove that this is true is if we just set delta G to zero, which means it's at equilibrium, then this delta G naught is equal to negative RT times the natural log of KEQ, okay? <clears throat> However, many times we aren't at equilibrium, and so that's whenever we have to put in the letter Q. And so this is just stating what I've been saying before, is our pH would be zero if we are at one molar, because 10 to the power negative zero is equal to one. Um, which is just ridiculous, but because most cells are going to be near neutral. It's not true for every cell, like the stomach cell is going to be different than, you know, the brain or the muscle. The muscle is different if it's been at rest versus at inactivity, during an, a during an activity, I should say. <clears throat> and so that's why we use pH 7, which is 10 to the minus 7 for hydrogen. And once again, if magnesium is involved, we consider that to be one millimolar because it's usually within that range. And then we use that different symbol, the delta G naught prime. Okay. So we're gonna look at ATP and the hydrolysis of ATP next. So ATP is sort of the currency that our cells use for energy. Right. Is it the most highly exergonic, um, even you know, phospho compound out there? Like, are there things that give off more energy than ATP? 
whenever they get hydrolyzed and reserve phosphates? Yes. Yes. In fact, we're going to find out one's called PEP, phosphoenolpyruvate. It's the most of the glycolytic cycle. And so why do you suppose that we just don't use PEP then, or we'll use one that's even higher? ATP is pretty high. Negative 31 kilojoules per mole is pretty high. No, it's very, it is quite common. But no, you know, Rylan is really close. And the fact that if it gives off so much energy, it's going to be harder, harder to make it, right? <laughs> so you're going to have to find out. It takes multiple steps just to make the, P, the, the PEP because um, it is a glycolytic intermediate. And so it's, it's naturally occurring. You do see it in your body. But um, I think it's ironic, at least in English, that it's abbreviated as PEP for phosphoenolpyruvate. And it gives you PEP in that sense. However, it would take a lot of energy and a lot of resources just to make it, if that was the one that was constantly being used. <clears throat> All right, and so this just shows you how the equilibrium constant, so it's KEQ prime, because that's under bio, biochemical standard conditions. Of course, it's going to be the products. That's really annoying. The products, which the products here, you have to include the hydrogen. <clears throat> ADP and PI over the ATP, we can ignore water because its concentration is relatively unchanging since it's the solvent. Okay. And you get negative 30.5, negative 31. Notice this one they did at 298, not at 310, but it's not greatly different at 310. I don't know why the book here didn't use the 310 value. <clears throat> And so it is endergonic. It is spontaneous. Energy is released. Plus we have lots of the, we're going to find out the homeostasis between ADP and ATP and GDP and GTP is tightly regulated. That's in chapter 14. I think it's the next chapter. It's right here. It's just a quick little easy way, little table to show, so if the equilibrium constant is one, by definition, the natural log of one is zero, because 10 to the zero have to be, has to be, or e, even e to the zero has to be one. Um, I'm sorry, e to the, <laughs> yes, all right, let's go there. So delta G is zero, so KEQ is B one. And so therefore, if delta G is negative, that means KEQ is greater than one, which should logically make sense. That means that you need more products since they go on top than reactants. If it's negative, that means that, um, I mean, if delta G is positive, then that means that you have a bigger number on the bottom, so you need more reactants and products at equilibrium. So it's gonna go backwards. And so here are some of the values of the different types of reactions that you could use. And those, these are standard conditions. But in vivo, the cell is hardly ever, well, probably is never going to be at standard con conditions where you always have one molar of ATP and one molar of ADP. Yeah, that's not going to really happen. Or one molar of glucose or what have you. Okay, but you can see we have the different types of functional groups. So don't forget your functional groups from biochem and from organic chem. So we have the anhydrides. So you can take acetic anhydride and break it down to make acetate vinegar, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and it's highly exergonic. Of course, then you'd have problems with pH easily. You also get more energy if you break ATP down to AMP and give off inorganic pyrophosphate. And you're going to find out that that does happen sometimes in vivo. Because we have another enzyme called inorganic pyrophosphatase that will break down the PPI. We have esters and amides and sugars and things like that. Now, if you look down here at the bottom, I wanted to specifically point out glucose and palmitate. So glucose breaking down to carbon dioxide. So that'd be what process metabolic process would start this. It's not the entire process, but what process starts glucose going to along that line? That's glycolysis. And then palmitate to carbon dioxide 
What is palmitate? It's a fatty acid. Okay, and so what process starts it? What's the first process for breaking down fatty acids? Pardon? See, a lot of you know, can remember glycolysis, but you forget. No, because palmitate has already been cut. Those are free fatty acids. So you can't say it's lipases. I mean, it's kind of it's a metabolic pathway. It's a major metabolic pathway. Can it also go through cellular respiration? It's part of it, but what one is it specifically? Is it your nope. It's beta oxidation, which is uh, it's, it's it's an amazing one because we're going to find out. They're different, they have different shapes. Citric acid cycle is a circle. Of course, it's a cycle. Same thing with the urea cycle. Glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are linear, while beta oxidation is a spiral. So they have different, sh they look differently. That's beta oxidation. Which one gives us more energy? Glycolysis or beta oxidation? Beta oxidation, by far. You're going to see that. I want to work through a couple of things math wise with you. So these common intermediates, because these metabolic pathways that we're going to be starting on, they all have more than one step. I mean, that's why it's a pathway. Otherwise, it'd just be a step. We don't say a metabolic step. And so glycolysis has 10. Gluconeogenesis has 12, I do believe it is. Um, beta oxidation's got four. Citric acid cycle has eight. And it also depends on if you start from the beginning or not. And so that's why sometimes you're going to find that there are feeder pathways, and it becomes much more complicated. But you can figure up the delta G overall for multiple reactions or the KEQ overall for multiple reactions because it has to go back to the math that's behind thermodynamics here. And so the standard free energy changes are additive. What does that mean if something is additive? You just add them or subtract them, right? And so whereas if it's multiplicative for equilibrium constants, you would have to multiply or divide when it goes in reverse. I completely made these up. So, and the PC version doesn't have the equilibrium sign arrows, and so that's what the little weird <laughs> figures are supposed to be. So this would be A plus B is at equilibrium to C plus D. Two E's at equilibrium to D, E plus F and to G. I will skip ahead to where if you add, like if this was a metabolic pathway, then you could form A plus B plus 2F is equal to C plus 2G. So we'd want to know, like, how did we get to there? Let me make these bigger. And I hopefully the math will come out okay. So a little bit of this is from, I don't want to use that same color. Okay. So a little bit of this is if we have A and B, and it makes a D, but notice that here, this one right there is backwards. Whoops. Oh, don't do that to me. How do I get? There we go. So this is backwards, because D is a product. But notice D isn't here overall, because it's called a common intermediate. Okay. So that means in the second step, it's really the reverse of this. So it's D that goes to form two E's. It's breaking down. And so what you would do is you need to take the reversal of it. So we're just going to flip it around to make it, I'm running out of room, D going to form two E's. Whoops. Is not wanting to write. Well, hopefully in your notes it looks a lot better. D's for me two E's. And then what's the problem with reaction three? You need two F's plus we have two E's, which would be a common intermediate. And so plus you need two G's, and so we're just gonna have to double all of this. Okay, so now we have to think about what's gonna happen to the equilibrium constants. 
KEQ for reaction number one is the same. We didn't do anything to it. But for reaction two, we're doing the opposite. So if it, something is a multiplicative property, when you do the opposite of it, what happens to that number? You flip it, right? That's the important thing. You don't just put a negative sign in front of it. That's why I didn't want to put a negative in front of the parentheses there. And so this becomes, instead of 10, it's going to become 1 one tenth. I'm going to have to write ridiculously big. My stylus is about shot. Okay, so if that's number two, is now going to be one tenth. What about um, when you m multiply something that's multiplicative, what happens to it then? Does anyone remember? That's the one that's a little bit more difficult. You raise it to that power. And so it becomes 5 squared, since we're multiplying it by 2, so that becomes 25. 25. So now we just have to multiply this. Well, you'd always check just to make sure that everything canceled out. But for time's sake, we're going to know that we now really do the two E's cancel. The each D cancels itself out. And so that's where we get A plus B plus 2F is equal to, or not equal, is that equilibrium here with C plus 2G. So the new KEQ is going to be 100. Because that number didn't change. <laughs> this, I, plus if I switch to my left hand, it doesn't help. 100 times 1 tenth times 25, which it's really not wanting to write, which is equal to 100 divided by 10 is 10. 10 times 25 is 250. There. I have to go invest in a new stylus. So it's 100 times 1 tenth times 25. And so that's, that's how they come up with some of those tables where you can add up all the different parts. You know, like I said, for that glycolysis, of course, they went all the way from glycolysis through to all the way down to carbon dioxide um, to get their KEQ values. I'm gonna, just because we could, we still have class. We still have five minutes. <laughs> They're just really excited. I don't know what class is after. Oh, it's, doc, it's Dr. Kimball once again. I know. His, his students really get excited. Okay, so once again, we were going to take the reverse of that. We're multiplying this one. We're I shouldn't say multiplying. We're doubling it okay, right there. But now we have G. G is an additive property. Well, the 100 stays the same because nothing changed. But in an additive property in the reaction, when you reverse it, what happens to it? It becomes negative, right? So it's negative 10. And what about additive properties when you double it? Right, it just multiplies. And so be five, it, it, it be, <laughs> I can't speak, but it will be 5 times 2, even though it looks like it says divided. So it's going to be 10. <clears throat> and since this is an additive property, now I'm going to switch to this. this is, we would have, technically it's delta G, but I can't do a delta on here. So delta G would be equal to, we just add those three numbers together, 100 plus a negative 10 plus a positive 10 would be equal to 100 on this one. So we can see that, um, and now if you put that delta G and that KEQ together, that won't they won't be the same because I just made those numbers up. But <clears throat> that's why these would be two separate processes altogether. But I just wanted to show you what it meant to be something was additive versus multiplicative. Okay? So the important equation to know is that one that would have the Q in it. And just realize that Q, that KQ means Q is that equilibrium. Um, from that, you can solve for KEQ, you can solve for Q, you can solve for everything. Are there any questions? Q is literally just products to their power divided by the reactants to their power. It's just KEQ is literally Q at equilibrium. 